there is no waste in nature. When a tree falls, it's only halfway through its life. When a bear or an animal uh, finishes eating food and processing it in its body, that becomes fertilizer for future life on the forest floor. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing, the way nature has worked this all out. There is no waste in nature. Uh, the human animal is, in fact, the only animal on the planet to create waste that nature cannot process. One of the reasons I got involved in this industry is to highlight the issue of waste as one of the most important environmental issues of our time. And I think a lot of other issues have gotten a lot of attention. We've been really lucky. I think recycling is getting more and more popular. But I think the idea of garbage in general, of landfills, of being done with something, putting it in a bag or putting it in a can at the end of your road, that it just goes somewhere. And the truth is, that somewhere is also a place on this planet that we all share. Really, when it comes to landfills, it's a Nemu, not in my universe. I not only don't want it in my neighborhood or in my backyard, I really don't want it in my county, and frankly, I don't want it in my state. Put it somewhere else. Well, everybody else feels the same way. Well, what if we took a stance that said, only in your backyard? You generated it, you deal with it. I think there's some value in that. It would make people start to think a little harder about, well, what am I doing? Where is this going? Whose problem really is it? Now, you have to understand that in Seattle, we don't have our own landfill. We instead contract with a landfill that's actually located in Oregon, uh, some 250 miles away. And in order to get the trash there, it has to be loaded onto trains, a mile-long train filled with trash. The train leaves at 3 o'clock every day from Seattle except for Saturdays. It goes 250 miles to Oregon where it then goes up a hill into this huge landfill um, where in the winter they actually have to heat up the cars in order to dump all the garbage. And there's a, it's a huge landfill and there's a huge 30 foot tall chain link fence near the top of the landfill and then another one further away, a smaller one, just to catch the plastic bags that are blowing. It's a really amazing place to go to. And we're all paying for landfills around the country. Everybody in the U.S. is working with some system, whether it's a municipal system that manages their own waste locally or if it's a system that ships their waste to other parts of the country. And, you know, there's so many different models in how that works. The resources involved in picking that up from your curb, taking it to wherever its destination is, and then having to dispose of it, you're still part of that. And the reason you should care is because that's going to make a difference for the environment, for the economy, for your costs, for all of the things that you care about. It's going to make a difference. You know, in economics, um, there's this term of externalities. And there's a lot of costs out there that we collectively bear as a society, whether it's um, habitat destruction, or whether it's costs that are directly being imposed on us as citizens who didn't ask for those costs to be put on us. So the cities are under huge budget pressure right now, and they need to cut their costs. And if they can cut their costs in terms of how they're managing their waste and start to make more money off the recycling, so these plastics they can make money off of if they get them separated and people are actually recycling them. And the same thing with compost. So it's, it's, it's a really can become more of a fiscal issue than an environmental issue in some cases. Our latest statistics is that even with the recycling as high as it is in King County, that still more than half of what's going into the landfill could be recycled or reused. You know, Seattle with its um, premier recycling program, it's the program of the country, probably people in San Francisco might argue with you. And 60% of the residential waste is still recyclable, you know, so we're not, 70% of the commercial waste oftentimes is recyclable, so there's a huge opportunity. And by recyclable, I mean there's collection programs, there's markets, there's technology. It's not esoteric blue sky stuff. It's worth noting that garbage is more expensive than recycling um, and for a good reason. You haul your garbage off to a dump and it gets covered and buried there and that location, that site, then has no more use, whether it's that land or the product you're putting inside of it. So 3.5 million tons of garbage in the current Cathcart landfill took us 12 years. That was it. It's a 56-acre landfill. You know, you can do the math on, on how high that was. When it was done, 
you're not really done. You just don't get to use it for uh, a revenue purpose anymore. Now it becomes a revenue extractor. And you now spend money to maintain this carefully contained trapezoid of trash. You pull out the gas, that costs money. You pull out the water and you treat that water. And then you sink monitoring wells around the landfill and you monitor those landfills to trace the extent of the third law of thermodynamics, everything leaks. And all of that costs money. And it's money against which you're not making revenue, so therefore it is now a cost center. Landfills in general, in the 30-year post-closure period, are somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 million bucks. You ask yourself, why, why should things go to the landfill? Why should we use space, land, for garbage? Is that a good idea? I mean, I think we're all starting to see that this world we live in isn't all that big. If your only measurement is dollars, then I think one could make the argument that yes, people here are paying the full freight of their garbage. I mean, it, in fact, it's dramatically inflated. Their, their garbage bill is paying for salmon habitat restoration and graffiti removal and lots of other things that that the municipalities do that are good, and, and, the, and, the, and those things are funded through utility taxes. And, um, but I also believe that if you, if you count the impact on the, the world and the environment, then, th then there's no doubt that um, we are stealing from the future. Tipping fees provide a significant incentive. Uh, a lot of what we see, if we can't, uh, you know, let's say make money or extract value of, from the commodities, we need to cover our costs through um, the avoidance of disposal fees, and that's a big incentive. And so when you have markets like Seattle or Vancouver up in Canada, which is part of my area, where they have high disposal fees, it's for a reason, because they're trying to promote recycling and uh, wasting less. We've got excess, excess landfill capacity, but the, yeah, the issue is really conservation of resources, wise use of resources. If you have waste, you're, you're, you're inefficient, you're wasting money, There's, it's an opportunity, it's an opportunity to reduce costs increase profit. So from a commercial standpoint, you know, waste represents an opportunity to be more efficient and more, more profitable. Go visit your landfill. Go see what you're putting in there. See what it looks like when you and your neighbors and everybody else conglomerates their trash. Come to the transfer station. It's closer. See what people are throwing away. You'll be surprised. Because there is value in the things that we are generating, the things that we consider to be trash are valuable. There's things that can be done with them, resources that can be used. And secondly, we live on a finite planet. There's only so much stuff that we can generate and uh, then turn into trash. We throw way too much away in our society, and uh, whether it's scrap metal, cardboard, paper, food waste, plastic, all that stuff has a better use, and it really makes no sense to landfill it when you can recycle it. You know, a pollution is a resource out of place, you know, it's back to Barry Commoner, and so if you, something's going in a landfill, you know, you're kind of giving up on it. As though you're taking trees from the forest and you are harvesting them and then uh, depositing them in the landfill. You're taking barrels of oil from the oil fields and you're depositing those in the landfill. You're taking money from the communities, opportunities for jobs, and so on, and depositing and throwing all that out. Arguably, in a post-apocalyptic Mad Max universe, we're going to be mining those landfills for the resources. So you could say, wow, that's actually the world's slowest materials recovery facility. Put it in a dirt pile, send it into the future. Eh, some of the organics decay, not many. Some of the organics decay, then we unbury it. Woo! Smells bad. And we go back in for the metals and the glass and the plastics that we can no longer mine from the earth because we already got them all. So all those things that we've thrown away for all these decades in the landfill may become very valuable. And what a shame it is, in my opinion, to spend the resources of both uh, the human resources and the financial resources to fight over things like oil. Turn around and make a plastic component, then use it for two minutes or less, and throw it in a landfill forever. What a waste. We, we, we just got to change the way we do things. We need to look at actually the whole uh, stream of everything kind of in terms of its whole life assessment. Uh, how much impact is there in the mining of the material? How much impact is there in the manufacturing of the product? How, is, how far does that product have to be transferred in terms of transportation and energy costs? And then how does it get installed and how toxic it is and all these kinds of issues. And then at the end of that product's life, what happens to it? 
and taking a hard look at that and then asking the question, do I want to participate in this? Do I want to add to this? And I think most people would say no. I think if they really knew what went into manufacturing and what went into disposal, that they would make an educated decision. And I think most of what we generate, we generate because we've been told that it's okay to waste. And I think it's time to tell a new story. Zero waste is a perfect universe in which everything is described as either being in the technical cycle, so it's um, minerals, rocks, electronics, those kinds of things, or it's in the biological cycle, food, vegetation, those kinds of things which degrade over time very quickly. Zero waste is the universe in which everything that falls into one of those two categories, and darn near everything does, is always in a loop such that you don't have things falling out into waste, falling out into a landfill for somebody else to deal with later. If you look back at the kind of waste that Americans had in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, everything was reused. Every, even clothing, you would get down to the threads and then the, the rag person would come and actually weave those into rope and other things. All food was composted if there was any food waste and all the packaging was reused and reused until it was then made into something else. So we had virtually no waste. Um, you know, a hundred years ago, and everything was reused, and and you just it was it, people didn't have the money to just let things be disposable. If zero waste is really reframing the idea of valuing everything that we use, and assuming that that value moves forward, and that it shouldn't end up in a landfill. And I kind of see there's sort of three main avenues of that. There's sort of the idea of on the production side, are we creating producible materials that um, are more sustainable? and sort of reduce their impact on the environment. On the consumption side, are we reducing our consumption um, to basically just what we necessarily need? And then sort of lastly, the, the waste side of it, you know, increasing our use of composting and recycling rather than just throwing it away and putting it in the landfill. You know, when you talk about zero waste, you're really talking about a system from extraction to manufacturing to production, packaging, distribution, use, and so forth. And there's, um, <clears throat> you know, waste all along the way. It, it's sort of like saying not giving up. It, it's, it's like a doctor would say, zero disease, you know. Doesn't mean that we're going to get there tomorrow or, or in 10 years, but uh, from a doctor's point of view, no disease is a good disease. You know, we're, we're not going to ad admit to, to uh, having a residual type of disease level. Same thing with waste. It's something that we, we want to work towards avoiding as much as we can. I can easily draw the same conclusions, um, and I, I don't think that zero disease is possible. So at the same time, I don't really see that zero waste is possible. We are a save the world type organization, but we're also very pragmatic. And I believe that there, you have to take a pragmatic approach to reducing waste. I personally don't like the phrase zero waste. I, I just don't think it aptly describes what the goal is, but I understand that a lot of people like that phrase. They like zero, zero waste, there's no more waste. Well, that's not a reality. There's always gonna be some fraction of waste coming out of somewhere or as a processing residue. So the question is, is zero waste a good or bad term? And we find that it's a good term to use with the public because um, they get it immediately. You don't have to start saying recycling, composting. It's just a simple two word thing that people can immediately grasp. And the idea behind it is to do reduction over time. So it's not gonna happen overnight. Now, some of it can be recycled, some of it can be reused. Some of it we really have to think very carefully to see whether there's an opportunity for doing something better with it. But simply throwing it away, that's not good enough. That's again a philosophy, but I think just reducing waste in general, and in many cases because that will provide a cost incentive that businesses are starting to do it, I think it's building. I've told a lot of people this, I think there'll be more change in this industry that we're in in the next five years than there's been in the last 40. I think people look to Seattle as an example of what is possible for that the utility, you know, the partnerships for the utilities and the private businesses, you know, the sort of policies and incentives that are in place to make it a more economically, um, you know, attractive thing for businesses to do, and the services that are available. And we have some very innovative haulers and collection services here for people, and there's lots of opportunity to recycle a lot of different materials. Humans are very creative. And somebody will figure out how to make money 
taking even the least likely candidate for reuse and turning it into something fabulous. You know, quite honestly, we should probably be called material management. I mean, we're really, as a company, transforming to a new way of looking at it. We're actively building out recycling facilities, investing in new technologies that will make it easier for people to recycle material. And then what can't be recycled and becomes waste, we're also finding ways to try and extract value out of that waste by maybe turning it into things like renewable energy. Or one is the fact that we're using landfill gas and converting it to electricity. And we sell about 8.6 megawatts of electricity back to the city of Seattle. Seattle. The newest technology is a joint venture and a new company called S4 and that is really plasma gasification and what that does is creates a syngas which is a basic building block for many recyclable and, and renewable energy products. It can be used to make things like fuels, chemicals, uh, methane, um, compressed natural gas. There's many things that can be generated from that syngas. And the byproduct of plasma gasification is it produces a glass based material which looks like a black glass that really encapsulates isolates the materials that are not uh, effectively turned into syngas and so you basically get this inert type material and uh, we're looking at potentially using that for road base or different things that could be reused or if we have to potentially landfill it because it's a small fraction of what went in initially that comes out as this residual uh, inert type glass material. Uh, contamination is still a major challenge in this business and some of the technology we're working on like plasma gasification doesn't really care about contamination but that's not going to be the end-all solution for everybody. Uh, clearly that's kind of an end-use product. Once recycling's taken place, gasification might occur. But I think farther upstream it's still contamination and people just, I think, don't realize how their small actions at their home or at their business can really affect it on the back end. We've diverted um, over four million tons um, since the company started and we've made approximately three million cubic yards of, of product that we've sold. Well, the food waste volume is, is about 70, 75,000 tons a year that we're currently taking in. There is a lot more food that's continuing to go to the landfill and it's why most of the municipalities are focusing on the food volume. If you think of an old wagon wheel, like the cowboy days, you know, you have a big hub and then you have spokes. The hub is going to be the compost plant because whatever anything else does, you need it to make a product with the residuals, okay? Now one spoke could be anaerobic digestion, which we've been looking at now for about eight years. I think Jerry's been to Germany 15 times. Uh, another spoke would be maybe a biomass to electricity project. Another spoke might be a gasification process for um, some of the biomass. So they'll be in those technologies, they'll fill the wheel, but you still need that hub. Yeah, you can kind of look at it as kind of like a nutrient cycle where the nutrients are captured back, put back into the soil, and those soils then grow more crops that we then eat, ending up back into our feedstocks, actually. It's realizing the level of investment that it takes to try to do it right and uh, provide the environmental uh, assurances that are needed. And um, I think that's probably the biggest thing. And then how that relates to costing your the cost of the service and um, also the sale of the recyclables because it, it's a pretty horrendous effort, uh, financial effort to be able to do it, especially in a large scale. Our guesstimates are that there could be anywhere from 10 to 13 million gallons of used cooking oil in the state of Washington alone. 
um, a year. A year, a year, yeah, yeah. And uh, but we don't know that for sure. Again, there's there's so many ways to try to figure out where's this oil being used. That net opens up much larger when you start to think about uh, who is producing food products for consumers. Uh, it can be corporations, corporate campuses, shopping centers, airports property managers, hospitals, universities, and we provide them a solution not only to physically remove it, but to transform it into something much greater than just a landfill waste or an export product to a foreign nation. It starts from our, our drivers. They, they, they go out to the restaurants and the alleys and back of the restaurants. They vacuum out the, the waste spent cooking grease. They, they drive it back to our plant and we filter it and we put it through some centrifuges to take out water and take out solids and food and particulates. Clean it up, we add methanol and a catalyst and it separates oil and glycerin. What you have at the end of the day is biodiesel and glycerin and, bio and glycerin is our byproduct and that methyl ester is a biodiesel ready for your engine. The clients we serve, we're taking a waste stream from their business and uh, transforming it into jobs and taxes and low, low carbon fuel. I don't look at it as a difficulty, I look at it as a great opportunity. You have this huge model that uh, students, uh, faculty, and staff are engaged in. So this is an opportunity to have this living, learning environment on campus where everyone on a daily basis can be uh, engaged as environmental stewards. The three rules are convenience, 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 and you will actually get people to recycle and compost more. So we even work in some places to try and create better infrastructure where we always offer all three of those opportunities, recycling, compost, and, and hopefully a small amount of waste. Part of what we've learned over the years and what we've tried to do is, is standardize the look and the messaging as, as best we can. So we have one type of container that goes um, in conference rooms. We have another standardized set of containers that go in lecture halls and classrooms. We have a standard set that uh, look and, and feel and color that goes in public area places. The Minimax, it's a uh, garbage can that is uh, large for the recycling and tiny for the waste. Facility Services um, has become a leader in the use of Minimax and other universities are copying it and the Wall Street Journal actually featured it um, in addition, which is pretty cool. And a, uh, I think it was University of Texas or one of the major universities in Texas actually profiled that, which was um, kind of exciting and they, and they credited the university. There's a 20% rule that you have to work with. So you have 20% of people are going to completely ignore everything you do and despite Whatever efforts you may, you could grab them by the lapels and, and you know, yell in their face, this is what you need to do, and they're not going to do it. And you have 20% of the, your population that believes fervently in the cause, is so, so interested in the issue and, and so wrapped up in it that they're going to participate in everything that you offer them. And then you have your majority, 60% of folks in the middle, who you have to engage and you have to remind. And many folks need to hear things or see things in a variety of ways. And they say, and I can't remember the exact statistics, but people need to see something or hear something like six times before they really get it. If you don't make it like simple or like, convenient enough for them, they won't do it. And that's probably the biggest challenge, I would think. I mean, it's people, if you don't, they don't care in the first place and they don't think it's convenient, they wouldn't do it. So I guess the challenge is more like how we're going to spread the message in some kind of way that's convenient and understandable for people that will actually follow it. We've gone a long ways in a short amount of time. Six years ago, we recycled just 12% of our waste. And while we're striving for zero waste, we're happy that we're making progress in the right direction. Um, we've gone from 12% to as high as 85%.
and right now for the year we're averaging at about 80 percent rate so our goal is to get to 90 ultimately i think that might be feasible um, and we're taking one step at a time and to do that we're gonna have to sort our garbage um, and when you know 80 90 percent of our waste stream was going to the landfill the thought of sorting that was just too much to bear. Now that we're down to a 20% of the waste stream, it's it's a little more conceivable to say, hey, if we're going to push up our recycling rate, let's go get the stuff that's in the in the landfill bound waste and sort it. So sorting plays an integral part in really driving up the rates and to try to convey um, that recycling program to the front of the house to the guests is a challenge. So we've uh, we've gone to a completely compostable service where. Um, that we serve at our concession stands to try to accomplish that and we've pretty much eliminated the garbage stream for the front of the house so as you walk around Safeco Field you'll find about 500 compost containers and only 17 garbage containers um, we try to pair up a PET plastic container with every compost container to reduce the contamination um, but we pretty much for the front of the house for the guests have defaulted to recycling when the folks come to the ballpark and see that we can do it here, I hope they realize they can do that at home, they can do it at work, they can influence their school. Um, that's what I really hope they walk away from here, seeing that, hey, if you can do it in a ballpark in this big of area with this many people and all the complexities, just take something from that and, and ultimately we, we can do some good things. Well, I mentioned previously that we're both aspirational and pragmatic, so uh, that certainly uh, we brought that perspective to bear when we considered recycling, and we do recycle in the bathroom, for example, and in, in the kitchen, um, but we don't do it in the laboratory. So we, we look at it as a responsibility, and uh, part of our responsibility involves recycling and reducing, but part of our responsibility involves ensuring public health and making sure that we don't uh, create problems as we try to resolve them. But it's great to know that we don't have to like throw away tons of styrofoam boxes every day because to stay at the temperatures we need, pretty much everything gets shipped in styrofoam. Tons of packages every single day and a lot of styrofoam. A lot of them will come with one small little item in a big huge box of those peanuts and it's so nice to be able to just have that recycled, don't have to worry about it. We have a place, you know, over against a wall that we just put that. Um, I think, honestly, it's made life a lot easier to have these resources here as opposed to trying to think about, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to fill our own personal garbage receptacles with all the styrofoam? Are we going to take this huge, you know, printer cartridge and put it somewhere where it could leak everywhere? It's like, nope, it just goes right there and we don't have to think about it. both have a passion for food, a passion for health. Um, we care about our community. We use our food scraps to help local farmers feed their livestock. Um, so it's amazing what trash can do. If it's meat, he doesn't want meat to go to the livestock, so we take that home for our dogs. If it's anything that can be composted, that the pigs wouldn't eat, like eggshells and stuff, we put that and we have a composter outside now and we put that all in there. We have like a waiting list for the pig buckets of pig food. We have some customers that know about it and they want it for their chickens in there. So we have a waiting list of when one person's done, they want to get it. Um, and we have certain people that want compost from us. And you know, so the people that do know are eager to jump on and help and be a part of it. Almost everything we've done has saved us money. Um, the getting the food scraps and the composter and doing all that, um, we were able to cut down and get a smaller dumpster and that saves you know, 100, 150 a month.
a lot of customers come to us saying, look at our customers are demanding that we show and demonstrate that we're green. We want you as a sustainability partner, waste management, to help us achieve our sustainability goals. And luckily for us, with the contract that we have with the City of Seattle, is we have an incentive program that encourages us to work with customers to reduce waste because the city of Seattle knows that over time creating more and more and more waste is actually not the best use of community resources and tax dollars. And so for us as a hauler, whether we're hauling garbage or recycling, we do have a preference. We would rather the majority of that be recycling and be compost and be items that are not destined for a landfill. You know, and I encourage uh, small businesses and and facilities and corporations and the like to go to them first and partner with their local hauler because they have a lot of expertise um, in what can be collected, types of, of signage, types of, of containers. And there's just all these different sectors of businesses that that have real specific types of issues they're dealing with and we don't want to pretend that we, we know their business and, and we can tell them what to do. But if, if they have a recycling or a waste question, sometimes we can, we can help them and we can tell them what we think is needed as far as reducing waste. So, so we do one-on-one, -on -one, we, work, we work with business associations, we really do a lot of that. It can be definitely overwhelming, but I think that is exactly what Resource Venture is all about, is helping people wade through you know, navigate the choices, um, and it's a free service to them. So, you know, we come in and we say, let's take a look at what you have in place now, let's take a look at your garbage bills, um, and what can we do to turn that around? Our group uh, goes out and does um, free waste audits with customers. It's it's fun. People think it's going to be a little bit weird to start with, but you know, you just say, "We'll meet you at your dumpster, and we'll just pick out stuff and talk about what could what you might choose to do with this next time." Or you know, you could use cloth towels instead of paper towels and um, real cups instead of paper cups, that kind of thing. No, we we've got a lot of help in this. It's a huge team effort since it involves so many people to really change behavior for employees and fans. It's not something you, one person can do by themselves. Um, the Resource Venture came in early and helped us establish our composting program, back a house with our food service people. Um, of course, Cedar Grove is a huge uh, player in that all of our food waste and our grass clippings go to Cedar Grove for commercial composting. Um, the uh, compostable service ware is, isn't compostable in your backyard compost, but it is in a commercial composter, so we're lucky that we have Cedar Grove that can, can play that part. Uh, the City of Seattle has helped us, um, they, Seattle Public Utilities, um, and recently a year and a half ago, or two years ago now, changed the law so that single serving uh, items from restaurants had to be recyclable or compostable. That helped push the, the market in that direction. And, and it's easy f for me sitting in, in a government position to say, you know, we need businesses to step up. But when we have these open, honest dialogues, what we often hear is businesses saying, well, we've tried to step up and you government has put some barriers in there. And so, you know, we have a responsibility as, as government to also come part way and understand the business's challenges and figure out what it is we need to do. Is it, is it a different delivery or pickup system? Is there a different market we need to help create um, for recyclable materials? Um, and there's work that we can do there for sure. And we've, we've done some great work in the past and, and it's going to be those type of partnerships moving forward that we'll need to do also. Zero waste initiatives for businesses start with the green team and doing a baseline analysis of all of the waste that's generated on site from that business, whether it's an office building, whether it's a restaurant, whether it is a manufacturing site, and taking a look at production, um, everything that's purchased for that site, and then everything that's disposed of. What we advocate for is for people to just take small steps. We're not talking about people changing their life overnight. And I think that's what sort of freaks some people out. Like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm got to do it, become green automatically and, and overnight. And, and that's not really what happens for most people. It happens over time. I think a lot of companies look at something like this and think it's just too big. It's just too overwhelming. There's no difference that my business can't make a difference. And I can understand that line of thinking unless you just start small. 
and say, okay, well, let's just look at our recycle bins at the, every, at the end of every day um, and see what we're recycling. Um, and let's look at our garbage bins and let's look at our food compost. We didn't even, we didn't even compost food a few years ago at businesses, uh, and now we do. Pick one thing where they can have an impact and then look at the, the um, results of that one change that they made, one, whether it's a purchasing change, whether it's starting you know, collection of recyclables on site, uh, any of those things can have a tremendous impact. So pick one thing, look at it, gather those numbers, share those numbers, and that'll get you started down that path and you'll see that there's you know, economic reasons to do that and you'll continue down that road and find other, other ways to become more sustainable. And individually, sometimes there may be a cost to first start a system. There's usually a startup cost. To educate people, there's a cost to starting that up. Uh, you may have false starts. You may not have the system designed very well, and so mistakes are easy to make. So there's a lot of reasons why people are cautious about moving forward. But what our experience has been is that once you get people started, then it's like, why weren't we doing this all the time? I think when we talk about sustainability and doing things that are green or being sustainable, we really want to be at a place where we aren't using that word anymore and we're just talking about the way we do things. Get rid of the trash can under your desk. Go to a centralized trash can in your office environment so that people understand when they have to carry their trash down the hall, really why did they generate it in the first place. Every single office, every single desk area in fact, there'll be a couple desks in each office space and everyone has their own recycling receptacle. So it's not like there's just one for a big room. There's many, 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 which is great. Right, I got rid of a garbage can in my office two years ago. I don't use it at all. In fact, I don't actually have garbage. Um, because I'll take it out to the main area. And I can't just, even though the garbage can's right there, recycling bin's 10 feet away instead. It's not a big deal to do that. And then after you do it for a while, you get in the habit of it. You know, having paper towel recycling in the bathroom is really nice. It's really, it's phenomenal to get to work in an environment that is socially and environmentally conscious. Even on our um, hand towels, there's a, these come from trees stickers. And it's interesting how much buzz that generates in terms of people saying, oh, now I, I mean, it's, they, they see it as both sides. They see it as, okay, now I'm aware, but they also joke about walking out of the, uh, bathroom with wet hands because they really hesitate before pulling that second towel out of the dispenser. Um, in Seattle, the tiering of pricing for your um, disposal of trash is, is higher than if you do recycling or if you do compost. We compost at home and recycle at home, so it's kind of just second nature for me to do uh, that kind of stuff at work. Some people, I notice, don't really realize, oh, we can compost this, like there's a food container mm -hmm. or uh, paper towels that are dirty, you can put in the compost, and uh, it's just a matter of put it in the right bin, they're all next to each other in the garbage, we make it pretty easy. You know, we've looked at it and you know, the people who who actually do, you know, take their waste and they put it in the recycling and they put it in the trash and they put it in the compost and separate it out, you know, the time that they spend doing that is not significantly more than the time that other people spend doing it incorrectly. It's 
So right next to our printer, we have a big recycling receptacle, which gets used far more than the trash. And people, I've seen people actually take a piece of paper out of the trash and put it in the recycling. So that happens a lot. In some cases, it's as simple as having offices start by setting their printers to default to two-sided printing and using print preview to see what you're gonna print before it pops out. It would be great if the person who's in charge of purchasing would really take a look at the um, green purchasing they could do. So for example, are they buying really high recycled content in the paper? Are they using printers who are using less toxic inks for the products that they're, um, you know, their brochures and that kind of thing? We've jumped on recycle, which is the last thing in the hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle. So the recycling is great, but if people, you know, kind of went back to, to square one, back to the beginning, which is, um, it's about reduction, about using less, um, I think that would be a, a good kind of thing to think about. We are so lucky here in the Pacific Northwest. We are full of very creative, private recyclers that have found recycling and reuse solutions for everything from bicycle inner tubes to styrofoam, things that would normally end up in the landfill. In January of last year, we, we for the first time, styrofoam block. Uh, there was an ability and a market um, to divert that. There was never a local, um, processor that would take styrofoam block. It's not heavy, so it's it's not a lot of weight, but it takes up an incredible amount of volume. So we piloted in the health sciences complex where they get a lot of shipments, um, lab supplies and those such, so there was a lot of styrofoam. Once we got that up and running and the vendor was picking up um, regularly, weekly, um, from our facility as we collected it and we knew what type of bags worked well for people to put them in there. We educated people on you know, what could go in there and what, what isn't allowable. And then we launched it campus wide. We'd like to let people know that that recycling for batteries and for the printers is not just for office stuff. If you have a cell phone battery, you can put it in there. Things like that, trying to make people realize that this is a resource that they can use not just for work-related items, but if they come in and they happen to have a ton of stuff or receipts that they can use this recycling as well and be sure that they are taking advantage of that resource. So sustainability also is about supporting a local economy. And when you, when you work with local vendors and you explain your vision about sustainability, you find out that they have their own vision about sustainability too. And by collaborating together, you can really help drive sustainability for your region by working with local providers and by supporting the local economy. So you've got to get a team of people to help you because you can't do it yourself. You know, if you're running a business, you don't have time to deal with it. Small businesses in particular, they're limited for resources or limited for staff. You need basically a, um, a network of capacity and willingness and through our service provider, we have that capacity. And then um, through education within IDRI and through working with other organizations in this building, we've developed a willingness on the part of the individuals to participate. And the more that we can partner with uh, various suppliers as well as um, our utilities, as well as our kind of peer businesses, um, we're all gonna be more effective. And so I think it's working together. I think it's making commitment um, as a company, setting some goals, writing them down, making sure everybody knows what they are, and then working toward them and making sure that everybody can participate in a meaningful way toward that and be part of the success. We have to be restructuring how we do things, but at the same time we have to be cognizant of the business community and what is the real driver in business. I'm, I'm an economist at heart. <laughs> you know, I'm a finance guy, a numbers guy, and the things that, that drive me to take on challenges oftentimes are, are economic. Um, and so when you show me a garbage can that I'm currently using and say, um, but if you could get all your garbage into something half the size, you would save $15 a month. Um, even if $15 isn't a, a significant amount of income for me at the time, it's real. And now, and now you've, you've uh, 
issued the challenge. In this day and age, it's, it's not just about um, the environment, it's about the economics. And we've spent a lot of time over the last um, few years making sure that our system is efficient and is viable, economically viable. And so when I talk to the campus community, I can go out and, and tell them that it's, it, it's not only the right thing to do for the environment and the planet and our university, but it's the right thing for your pocketbook because it is cheaper um, for the campus and we do have large amounts of avoidable costs because of the things that we do. I mean, I think in general everyone wants to do the right thing, uh, but clearly there's a cost barrier to some degree. And by being more efficient to me equals less cost. And so it's not just waste in the sense of garbage, it's waste in the sense of process waste. And so when you come in and look at your business and take a step back, maybe there's ways that you can reduce the actual garbage you put out, but maybe on in, in the same process you can figure out ways to just be more efficient and therefore save money look at improving efficiencies and it's not just about uh, alternate products or supplies it's about eliminating excess um, and um, you know looking at it that, that consumption uh, part of the, uh, the equation. I would say that it's essentially been cost neutral that we've taken our resources we've uh, used them um, more wisely and we've ensured that they've had the greatest impact possible and that involves developing new technology for the developing world, vaccines, diagnostics and new drugs but it also ensures that we reduce our waste in a way where we don't have an impact on the same developing world that frequently receives the developed world's wastes. Solid waste disposal costs are not a huge part of the cost for most businesses. For some they are, um, but for most they're not. But they actually are able to help foster an environmental ethic in their employees, which every evidence that we have demonstrates that that improves people's morale, it makes people more cooperative, more ready to work, and it provides you with a marketing, an ability to market to the public as a company that really cares about the environment. And, you know, a lot of times we talk about the economics in this very small sense of how many dollars and cents you're going to save, but the fact is the productivity of your employees and the ability of your company to m move in the market successfully and to have a good, positive, popular image is actually a much more important economic benefit. You know, it's, it's all about in, environmental benefit, brand value, and your customers and saving money, right? So if you can do something and it speaks to your customers, adds to your brand value, has real true environmental impact, why wouldn't you do it? I've never had a business person tell me, that doesn't make any sense to me. Everybody says, wow, that's a real, that totally makes sense. Whether or not they step forward and invest is another thing, but I've never had anybody tell me that doesn't make sense. I think we live in a part of the country that places a high value on this. Um, and our awareness level is much higher up here than it is in other parts of the nation. Uh, so I think that it has become, it has moved from uh, an esoteric, unusual thing to a, a, a thing that brands really do want to attach themselves to. Uh, when we first approached Amazon over a year ago, uh, they practically cut the meeting off at the midway point and said, we get it, we love it, let's do it. They, they said, we don't need to hear more. Uh, and we collect all the used cooking oil from Amazon, um, which has only gone up significantly since they moved their campus down to South Lake Union. And it's a brand value to them. They, they are, it's very important to them as part of their larger enterprise to minimize the impact, the environmental impact of their business. And that reaches, that, that gets to consumers. Uh, even if a, from a corporate standpoint like that, or from a restaurant, uh, restaurants in the Seattle area, that, uh, the Space Needle, SeaTac Airport, these are all places that are like, hey, if we can do the right thing, um, why wouldn't we? And it makes us very proud uh, because we do believe that we're doing good work in this area. Um, but I also think it continues to be an incentive. Um, you know, it's better to be get an A or better to be number one. Uh, being in the top 15, that's great, but let's strive for more. You know, we're never going to be perfect, and so it's it continues to be a catalyst. Um, the other is it's really good marketing. Uh, there's no question that students in particular are looking for a place to go to school that is green, but also for faculty and staff recruitment and retention, uh, many, many faculty and staff also believe that it's appropriate to be green. We want to be the best children's hospital in the country, and uh, the question that I had to our COO is, when do we know we're the best children's hospital? Uh, because it's not, it's not a point where you're just completely reached a state of complacency that you're the best children's hospital out there in the nation. You have to say to yourself, well, 
you know, we're always striving to be the best. And so striving to be the best means that we're looking at our processes and say that they're not perfect. Uh, but we're developing goals and strategies to say that we're uh, trying to align the best uh, processes going forward. And the lesson uh, for me is, and I think it's pretty universal, is that if you really do reduce waste, in fact, you will save money. And many times that which is environmentally beneficial is also efficient and will result in money savings, cost savings, stronger financial statement. It's time to retool. It's time for everybody to retool. There's never been a better time. This economic crisis should be an economic opportunity. I was a plunderer of the earth. My business, of which I was so proud, was a plunderer of the earth, part of a system that had to change. And I resolved to do what I could in the time I have left to change that.